Hey everyone, it's Scott from CertMedia.com, and in this video, I'm going to be covering Comic Cache, a free cache plugin for your WordPress website. Comic Cache used to be very, very popular. It's kind of leveled off in its growth, but it's still an, infect, an effective cache plugin. And if you are using it on your website, at least the light edition, we're going to cover its settings and give recommendations so that way you have the most optimal setup for the cache plugin. So the first thing when you install it, you get a nice little comic cache menu over here. And the first thing you want to do is yes, enable comic cache. This is what actually turns on the basic functionality, it allows the pages to be cached, which is really what most WordPress websites need, especially those on slower hosting platforms. And then the plugin deletion safeguards, basically this just says advanced configuration, recommend for advanced site owners only. And that's just a warning for all the settings that we're about to get into. So we have the automatic cache clearing. So what this is, is as it mentions, it's tools and settings that allow you to change when the cache is cleared. So this is already built into comic cache and the functionality is always on. If you delete or edit a post or a page or delete one, comic cache will clear the cache automatically. And then you have the primary page options. So you can choose to say, yes, if any single page is cleared or reset, also clear the home page. And when you click this, you get the drop down options. This is recommended. You want your home page to be purged if a single post or page has been updated, deleted, or modified in any way. And then you can choose to clear the post page. For those of you who don't know, the post page is what's set underneath the settings panel. It allows you to choose essentially the blog URL if you have a static home page. And then you can auto purge the author in, ter in term archives. I recommend this is also enabled. Auto clear category archives should also be purged along with tags. Date based archives, as I've gone in my Yoast SEO video, I don't really recommend ever using date archives. Um, they're basically just a means of structuring content by the published date. And the problem with that is, is most websites only push out one, maybe two posts in a given time period. And there's no real reason to go ahead and purge them because nobody ever visits them. Unless your website for some explicit reason is sending users to date archive pages, I wouldn't even worry about clearing them. And then you can auto clear custom term archives. This is if you just registered a custom taxonomy using custom post types UI or by code itself you want to go ahead and make sure they're purged along with this option. And if you are caching the RSS and the RDF atom feeds, go ahead and clear them. And then you can also auto clear XML sitemaps. For instance, Google XML sitemaps will be auto purged. And as it mentions, this is the default configuration. This will cover any of the general sitemap plugins, including Yoast SEO, all in one SEO, so on and so forth. We're just going to close this tab now and we're going to look at the cache directory. The cache directory is just what allows you to configure what URL your cache files are served from. So it goes in the WP content cache folder and it allows you to, um, it, it's in a subfolder for comic cache. This is the recommended. There's never really a reason to change this because this is just what's recommended. You're not going to see these URLs ever and neither will your users. And so there's no real reason to modify this. Now and then, then there comes the cache expiration time. So this is the automatic expiration time for which a page cache will remain. So as what I covered in the WordPress rocket video, if you're using comic cache, the default is seven days. Seven days is probably not a very good threshold because if you're using something like a contact page or you have a lot of complicated nonces on the front end, they'll expire before seven, eight, seven days are up. So you may want to reduce this time to like 10 hours or once a day. However, if you have a site that's fairly static, meaning you never change it or update it except for once a month or so, by all means, a seven days or even a month long cache is totally acceptable. And that can be easily changed by following the formatting here. Basically, you just type in one month, two months, three months, so on and so forth. And then the cache cleanup schedule basically just tells it how long, if you have an extremely large site and you lower the cache expiration time, this will set an interval in WordPress cron to automatically clean up those files. 
one hour is totally recommended for most sites. Client side caching, this is basically, it says the recommended setting is no, otherwise yes. So what this does is it prevents, no, prevent a client side browser cache of dynamic page content, or you'll allow the pages to be cached. Basically what will happen is, is you, with when it comes to WordPress in particular, you don't typically want to allow the HTML to be cached. And the reason for that is you can set last modified headers, which basically tell the server how when to send to the browser when the page was last edited or updated. And this can work, but the problem is, is it sometimes just doesn't work very well. And to be frank, all that you're really doing is saving them the 30 kilobytes or so of actual HTML they're downloading from your website. And I personally just don't recommend ever having the HTML be cached in the browser unless it's a static website or you have client side rendering, but that's not gonna cover WordPress websites in general. But I, you just don't need to mess around with this option, particularly if you're delivering the HTML to the user in about 100, 200, 300 kil, uh, milliseconds, that's about as fast as how it takes somebody to blink, so there's no reason to worry about that. If you have a really bad host, client-side cache can help, but the problem is, is it's gonna take them longer to see updates. They may not see the latest post you publish. You may not see the changes that you've made on the front end, and it's obviously honestly more trouble than it's worth. You could choose to enable caching for query string requests, so permalinks such as uh, if you haven't changed your permalinks to a pretty permalink, so where it's not using query strings, like as it mentions here, this will allow them to be cached. However, other requests can also match this. So if you said, I would like to cache URLs that contain a query string, um, search pages, for instance, they will go ahead and they could be cached. And the problem is, is query strings are typically meant to serve fairly dynamic content. So splitting up the cache that many times is not good for the users because it's just going to be regenerating and generating a lot of cache pages that almost nobody's ever going to see. I've never really seen users actively search frequently in WordPress using this default search window. And I almost never see somebody search more than once for the same thing. So I wouldn't really bother with this. You have 404 requests. Um, as it says here, no, it will not cache 404 requests. And the reason for that ultimately comes down to is because if it's served as cached, oftentimes it'll return a 200 response code, which means that it's not a 404 error, it's a 200 that this is okay, and it can cause issues. As it mentions here, it can, there's some workarounds and whatnot, but I wouldn't cache the 404 page. Typically what I recommend is leaving this off and honestly your best thing to do is just to handle 404s as they come up it, you shouldn't be sending too many users to 404 pages but if content has been deleted and somebody actually stumbles across that sending them to a 404 page is totally acceptable you have the feed caching feed caching i can typically recommend enabling now if you use something like feed burner you can experience issues where your feed burner feed will not update. Now we have the automatic cache clearing enabled, but it's just something to keep in mind. So, but I do recommend caching feeds, particularly because if you're serving a lot of users a feed request, it's just a lot of URLs that are hammering the server. It might as well be static. And even if you're not, and you haven't disabled them for some reason, there's no real reason to have them be hammered in case somebody is visiting them or a bot is visiting them. It's just easier on everybody. You can exclude a URL in this section from being cached. As it mentions, you can basically just copy the URL out of the page itself and just strip out the website URL beforehand. So if I wanted to strip out on this staging site, let's say I didn't want this post to be cached, I would just copy the URL like that. And that way it's just a subfolder and then that page would be excluded from being cached. HTTP referrer exclusions, if you want to exclude a referring domain, so you typically don't ever need to do this unless you're trying to track very specific data from some specific domain, but it's a really special and niche case where you should do this. 
for, for most websites, unless you know you need this feature, you don't need to touch this feature. For user agent exclusions, you can exclude a user agent for being served a cached version. As it mentions here, the W3C validator is excluded by default. You can also exclude things like iPhone, Android, and that means that they won't be served a cache page ever. I don't recommend doing this unless you have a very strange and niche issue occurring. Typically, like the W3 val W3C validator, that's a totally acceptable exclusion because it's not gonna be something that's hammering the server. But at the same time, if you are serving on the cached version, it can cause validation issues. It can also make it harder to debug errors that come up. But I wouldn't really modify this unless you're having a very specific and niche, niche issue. But even if you are, it's better to go through and try to debug the issue than to not serve them the cache page at all. Because you can be hindering user experience and the performance of your website for a lot of users. Then there is the Apache optimizations. So what this basically does is the plugin by default adds the expires headers. It adds the gzip. As you can see, gzip compression is highly recommended. If you do not have gzip enabled, you can just go here and click enable gzip. This will go ahead and take care of it. And then in the pro version, you get the ability to leverage browser caching and enforce canonical URLs and a bunch of other stuff. Frankly, the light version of this plugin is really bad. For what you get, it's not that good. You don't get a lot of features that you would get even in something like Cache Enabler, which handles leverage browser caching by default. And you don't get things that you would sort of expect. Um, any sort of lazy loading, not included. File optimization like auto-optimize, not included. And it has this very large and complicated user interface, but most of the settings in here are no more in depth than that of Cache Enabler. So if you are using Comic Cache and you need a free caching plugin, I'm gonna highly suggest that you swap away from it. Not because it's a bad plugin inherently, but because it's ridiculously complicated for basically no features. You get no substance other than it's serving a page cache. And between this cache enabler, WP Super Cache, W3 Total Cache, they're all gonna serve exactly the same premise. They're just going to cache your page and serve it as an HTML file instead of serving it as a dynamic request. You may run the test and you may get slightly faster TTFB, but ultimately that's just going to be variance in the test. Serving an HTML page cache because you've, you've enabled a rewrite in HT access isn't gonna be one isn't gonna be faster from one plugin to another. It's the same process. The only time it would be faster is if the plugin is serving it as a cached PHP file. But the only one that I know that still does that actively is W3 Total Cache Basic Cache. So those are my thoughts. Um, it works, you know the general settings now. Uh, I may cover the pro version in another video. The pro version actually has quite a few useful features, but the free version is not recommended anymore. This user interface is so out of date, it's complicated, and it's just not easy to navigate. If you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me in the comments section below, and I'll try to help you out. Um, but I do suggest switching to something else that's free. Cache Enabler is a great alternative. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.